We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Janice Glowski, and I'm the Museum and Galleries Director at Otterbein University. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to the A Roof Over My Head, a History of Equity and Architecture, Architecture webinar, which was inspired by artist Magna Pedicetus's Ghosts in Sunlight exhibition, which is currently open at Otterbein's Miller Gallery. I'm here hosting today with Margaret Kohler, who uh, on my screen is directly to the, to the right. Ghosts in Sunlight asks viewers to contemplate their emotional responses to race, class, and difference in the service of renewed critical consciousness. Today's panel discuss, discussion delves further into these topics using perspectives from the history of art, architecture, sociology, and lived experience. I'll begin with a brief introduction of our panelists, who, I will, who will each offer remarks on today's topics from their disciplinary and creative perspectives. We'll then have time for questions, which can be asked through the Zoom chat, and I'll alert you at that time. Magda Parasitis was born in Greece and immigrated to New York City in 1980 settling in a public housing project in Queens. She attended the Johns Hopkins University, receiving a BA in art history and international relations, followed by engagements in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Walters Art Gallery, and the Guggenheim Collection in Venice. She holds a graduate degree in advanced artistic studies from the, Institute, from the European Institute of Design in Milan. Parasitis' text-based art and photography practice focuses on the intersection of economic and racial justice with poor people's rights in the feminist perspective. Dr. Amy Johnson is an associate professor of art history at Otterbein. Her areas of study include modern European and American art and architecture, women's and gender studies, visual culture studies, and historic preservation. Her research focuses on the links between artist and society and the larger role art plays in communities. Her recent research projects explore the intersections of photography and historic preservation within the creation of the modern city. Dr. Dr. Carla Carrada is a professor of sociology at Otterbein. In addition to her doctorate, she holds bachelor's and master's degrees in architecture. Engaging feminist and critical race theories and employing qualitative research methods, she looks at the intersection of identities to understand how inequality is structured in space, place, and architecture. Her areas of expertise include social justice, race and gender, and social class. Paul Clark is a retired architect and associate professor of architecture and urban design. He has taught at the Boston Architectural Center, Miami University of Ohio, Mississippi State University, and Morgan State University of Baltimore. Currently, Paul teaches history of design in the Department of Design at The Ohio State University. He was a registered architect in Missouri, Ohio, North Carolina, and Maryland. He received his Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Virginia and his graduate degrees, a Master's of Architecture and Urban Design, and a Master of Social Work, both from Washington University in St. Louis. The majority of his office experience, of his office experience has been in affordable housing. And so at this point, I'm going to uh, share my screen. And um, if you want to turn your, adjust your Zoom, screen up into the upper right hand corner to speaker view you'll have a better view of the overall screen and the uh and the person who's speaking okay, okay so to get um would you like me to start janice 
Yeah, let me uh, just get a quick check. Does everything look okay to the panelists? All right, then just give me a yes. holler when you want it. Adjust. Okay. So go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to introduce a context for talking about housing in the public realm and especially talk about economic isolation and the architecture of inequality. What really we understand about housing in the United States is that it has been state sponsored segregation via many acts, but especially the homeowners loan corporation from 1932 during the Great Depression and the FDR administration, they made very low interest loans over a long period of time available uh, to people uh, who were white only. And this really is a portrait of the racism and discrimination that has shaped American housing policy for decades. The Fair Housing Act of 1968 tried to remedy what they did in the Home, Lo Owners, Home Owners Loan Corporation, which was to redline cities and put walls around neighborhoods that could receive these loans and that couldn't. So if you were within a red line, you were black. If you were within yellow lines, you were racial and ethnic minorities that weren't black Americans. And the green areas and blue areas were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants primarily. And this is a map of Columbus showing you where they were giving really affordable, great loans so people could um, keep, stay in their homes, have 30-year mortgages and such. So redlining is really what was state-sponsored and uh, spon and started our segregation or maintained segregation by race in America. And then the next slide. The most telling fact about poverty in the United States really and truly is how thoroughly we ignore it. And a, uh, an economist from the University of, of Wisconsin, Dr. Schmeeding, said, we choose to tolerate a lot more poverty than do other countries, which again is the backdrop for understanding the need for housing in America. And the next slide. So who's poor in the United States? Over 43.5% of the population was poor or low income, and that was before the pandemic. This includes almost or over half of children, and that's 39 million children. Also, uh, research just came out from the Pew Charitable Trust yesterday, and they said 60% of all children who go to public schools in the United States live below the poverty line. 45% of women, 60% of black people, 64% of Latinx people, and, and there's 66 million white people who live in poverty in the United States and in our need of quality housing. And the next slide. So as of July 2020, in addition, there were 10.6 million more Americans unemployed than there were in February. Nearly 43 million people were enrolled in the Supplemental Nutrition and Assistance Program, which is, you know, welfare and food stamps in April 2020. And this was an increase, since April 2020, and this was an increase of about 16%. And the next slide. So who lives below the poverty line? Again, those are some more stats. But we need to understand that 19 um, million people live in deep poverty in the United States with incomes below 50% of the poverty threshold. And that's about 3 million children who experience homelessness in the United States because of this. And the next slide. Just to give it a little more context, Jeff Bezos, the richest person in the world, even after his divorce where he split his wealth half with his ex-wife, look how much money, more money he's earned and how much his wealth has increased in 11 years. Also look at the federal minimum wage. It is stagnant. In Ohio, I believe the, fed, the minimum wage in Ohio is $8.70. This is setting up people via the next slide. Um, this is setting up people to be really, really poor. 
The pandemic has laid bare the long-standing inequity so many people face. Many str uh, households struggle to afford a decent and a safe place to live, and rents have risen within the last, uh, with the number of renters needing affordable housing has really increased. And these two pressures make finding affordable housing even tougher for America's poorest households. And the next slide. So it really is a social justice issue. Is housing, having a roof over our heads, a human right? We have housing instability with low-income households typically spending more than they can afford on what turns out to be substandard housing. And the next slide. So that was just to give you context. And now Dr. Amy Johnson. All right, well, I was struck when I was looking at, at Magda's uh, exhibition um, one line in particular um, stood out to me. It was more important what others said about us, not what we said about ourselves. I think that is a, a really important point that especially when we consider the stories that are still told today about poverty, about housing, um, about cities and you know, urban environments, uh, a lot of these stories have roots in the, the 19th century. Uh, and so looking back at my own um, scholarship in 19th century housing reform, um, I thought of a, a couple images that sort of get at um, some of these, these ideas, right? I mean, the issue of, of segregation, we know as, as uh, Dr. Corrado just pointed out, um, was something that really happened, um, was codified and formalized in the 20th century. It was not inherently part of the 19th century housing landscape. And so, so what we're looking at here is a, a model tenement. So the housing reform movement in the 19th century really sought to address issues of poverty and um, the overall public health of the urban environment through improving architecture, making architectural decisions and redesigning multifamily rental housing um, to make it healthier uh, and to make it more, um, you know, positive really for uh, the, the working families in, in these uh, buildings. Um, and so this is a, a model tenement designed by the architect Alexander Wadsworth Longfellow Jr. in collaboration with the artist Sarah Wyman Whitman uh, it's a, one of the first courtyard tenement houses in the United States where we can see that one of the things um, these housing reformers were concerned about was, of course, family life, right? And that children needed safe spaces to play. Uh, and so we see here in the, the courtyard, they put a fence around it <laughs> to protect it, uh, but there is a gate and we can see the children, there, there's some um, all around the courtyard and we see both black and white children and leaning out of the windows and then up here on the roof, we can see um, the women that lived in the, the tenement houses and we see a black woman um, over here uh, and then a white woman up here on the roof doing the laundry, right? So the significance that, um, and that you know, there wasn't this, this interest in, in segregating. It was more about providing um, a well-designed, um, safe environment. Um, and, and yet, at the same time, um, these, these stories of uh, surveillance, right, that also needed to accompany this. Um, was also Im important to these early reformers. And so where we see, you know, this interest in providing safe space, um, it's also balanced by, you know, we hire landladies, they always hired women um, to manage these properties. And because it was this belief that, you know, a sort of well-to-do middle-class woman would be able to educate and support and, um, you know, improve the lives of, you know, the, the, the women, the families living in, in the tenement houses, right? So this idea that if you're poor, you don't know how to, to clean your house or you don't know how to manage your money, right? And so this idea that we needed um, someone of a higher class status to sort of oversee and monitor um, people living in, in uh, tenement houses, which, you know, isn't the case, but it's just a story that continues today. If we could see the next 
slide, right? This issue of, of surveillance. Um, and it's a story that's, that's told um, certainly through the work of Jacob Rees. And these are images that are still used um, in textbooks today, right? That, that show us what, you know, the, the actual, supposedly actual living conditions um, were in areas like this is the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, in the 1880s. This is the photographer Jacob Rees, uh, whose work in housing reform um, was different. He didn't work in, in architectural design. He used photography to go around and document the living conditions and the architectural conditions um, of uh, these neighborhoods uh, to show how poor quality the housing was. Um, and so what you're seeing here is um, a basement room in a tenement building. Uh, and this was the type of room where you could rent a spot, right? So it's, the photograph is called five cents a spot. You paid five cents to get a spot to sleep for the night. Um, and so you didn't have a, a permanent room. You didn't have a permanent place to live if you had an extra five cents. At the end of the day, you could come and, and sleep here. And so Reese uses his camera to, to document the overcrowding, the lack of affordable housing, um, and different types of housing that was needed, right? The, we might need housing for just a single person, not for a whole family, that we might need, um, you know, different types of, of, of housing here. Um, what the image doesn't show, what the histories don't tell us as clearly is, you know, Reese, when he takes these photographs, he just barges in unannounced, right? He doesn't ask permission. <laughs> he didn't ask any of these men if he could take their photograph. He literally just broke in the door, set up his camera in this day with a, a flash photograph that was really dangerous, <laughs> and, um, especially in this type of environment. He had the, the risk of starting a fire and building the whole burning down, building down, right? So he would barge in, um, take photographs, um, and then circulate those images as, as evidence of, you know, the poor quality housing. Um, and look, we need to do, we need to do something, right? Meaning uh, the elite white, um, you know, residents need to address this problem because, you know, these, these people need, they need help, but they need, you know, if we're going to have healthy cities, we have to improve um, these living conditions um, for these people because they don't know how to do it themselves, right? So this issue of surveillance um, that, that I think is still present today and that, you know, I think Magda brings out so well in her, in her photographs in this exhibition, um, this, this way that, yeah, it's about the stories um, coming from the reformers, from white elites, from outside. They're not interested in getting the stories of yeah, who are these men and what types of, of homes do they need? What, you know, what are their lives like, right? It wasn't about that. It's about the other narratives, right? What others say about them. Um, and, and so I think that's something that really stood out to me uh, in thinking about housing today and issues of poverty that these are questions we're still not addressing um, that haven't changed. Um, and so I, I wanted to just share those photographs and I think I'm turning it over to Magda. So in the Ghosts and Sunlight project, um, I explore how what's normalized within visual culture, and in this case, in the aesthetics of public housing, communities and ghettos, impacts our ability to think critically about dominant narratives. Um, my family immigrated to New York City from Greece, and we were one of the first families to move into marine terrace houses. Um, built in the 1940s, marine terrace wasn't intended to be low-income housing, as we can um, see in this real estate brochure that markets the apartments as, um, you know, within proximity to transportation, to goods and services, to tennis courts and playgrounds, and it even offers life insurance as part of the lease package. So Marine Terrace of the 1940s um, becomes Marine Terrace houses uh, with the inauguration of the Section 8 contract with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in um, 1980, and this is the year that we move in. Section 8 
allows poor and low income people to rent a home at or below market rates, paying about 30% of their income to rent while HUD funds the remainder. Um, and of course, all of us living in the projects are profoundly aware of what subsidized housing allows us and that much more than any other social service we qualify for, an affordable home is the key to our survival. So while I recognize the importance of affordable housing as a refuge and a shelter for families like mine, for poor and low wealth people, home is so much more than shelter. Um, you know, it's about nurture and care and love and privacy. And these are precisely the domains that become subverted when communities of people are treated like communities of poor people. Slide, please. Twice. Click once more. There we go. So as Marine Terrace becomes poor people's homes, increasingly female, increasingly populated um, by poor, black, brown, and immigrant people, the entire premise begins to shift. When they become below market apartments, we begin to see a growing inequality between life in the projects and that in the wider neighborhood. John Powell describes inequality as a type of expulsion. So who's in the circle of human concern and who is not? And when they become poor people's apartments, this expulsion began. And as a child, my understanding of this, you know, sometimes quiet and sometimes overt shift um, came through observing the aesthetic shifts in my immediate environment, um, which was the courtyard. Um, where there were once benches, uh, where the children and their parents could gather in community, um, the courtyard became paved over in concrete and the benches were removed, effectively limiting encounters and mutuality. Um, there were ever more signs put up prohibiting any kind of play on the concrete sidewalks or the walkways, and um, signs prohibiting us from stepping on the grass, so there was quite literally no place uh, where one was allowed to be in a state of play or relaxation outside of the home. Slide. <clears throat> um, economic segregation has consequences regardless of whether we're talking about New York City or Columbus or any other place. Um, the first is neglect and disinvestment in low wealth urban neighborhoods. And one of the effects is um, communities that are under-resourced so that while white enclaves cluster and accumulate power and resources, poor neighborhoods are left to get ever more poor. There's a progressive loss of sustaining work and local businesses that has people turning toward underground economies for survival. Um, and with neglect come dwindling budgets for maintenance and upkeep of both the subsidized housing uh, communities and um, for the neighborhoods at large so that people living in subsidized housing communities um, <clears throat> uh, end up living in spaces that are both um, unhealthy and unpleasant. And often when poor people demand uh, improvements and attentiveness, their demands are um, delegitimized and discredited. And um, here I'd like to introduce the idea of debt versus citizenship. So debt implies that the poor are in some way unworthy, that there's something uh, shameful communicated through the rhetoric of you know, accepting handouts. Uh, in fact, at the opening of the Ghosts and Sunlight show at the start of the semester, one visitor told me, quote, you know, these people don't take care of their homes or their neighborhood, their neighborhoods. So we unload the economic and political reasons that lead to decline onto the shoulders of the poor as part of the rhetoric of cultural pathology or a culture of poverty, which is so denigrating and, and simply untrue. So the projects become symbols of decline, crime and decay, and decay as neglect becomes official policy. So as an artist, I'm interested in how the aesthetics of place communicate back the neglect and marginalization. Because neglect looks like one thing, 
and institutionalization and containment look like another. Institutionalizing the home is actually expensive. In my housing community, we saw the progressive impl implementation of, um, of what are known as layered controls. So mechanical lobby door locks with electronic key fob access that limit mo mobility, they limit choice and freedom since only the individual on the rental agreement can have door access. So for example, when I visit my mother, I can't have a key, I can't come in and out as I, as I choose. Um, this is also a way to track people's movements and have them under surveillance. There are video cameras at every entrance with signs alerting us to the fact that we're being surveyed. And, um, and the ubiquitous signs on front doors warn against all sorts of things. Um, the piece up on the screen on the left um, entitled Home has a, note, a notice on um, the door threatening prosecution for engagement in any homegrown business conducted inside one's apartment. Intimidating those that could read it and, and understand it from alternative sources of income that are entrepreneurial or refuse exploitation. Slide. So how do the state sanctioned aesthetics of spaces for the poor do the work of racism and classism? All of these physical and aesthetic tools um, that signify othering, the cameras, signs, fences, etc., are surrogates of state power and authority. So that via aesthetic means, it becomes impossible to live in a space free of state power. And we can debate whether any of these measures prevent crime, but the institutionalization and surveillance of ghetto homes deny the root sources of the troubles they're purporting to, to address. So layered controls don't account for the lack of adequate mental health services and health care, the lack of just labor markets that ensure living wages, um, a real estate market that's in line with incomes, and the millions of people that should be receiving public assistance and don't have access to it for a plethora of convoluted reasons. So there are multiple forces that are mutually reinforcing. What's certain is that there's been a progressive hollowing of the social function of the state. So the state as safeguarding one's basic welfare while amplifying the authoritarian po posture of the state. So especially weaponized against its most vulnerable people. Slide. Professor Kuroda um, outlined the racist policies that were instrumental in creating ghettos, but white supremacy also relies on an economic ideology as its corollary. So that perpetuates and reproduces the ghetto. So the only way that we've experienced ourselves or our history is through the lens of racial capitalism. So racist global system of capital and exploitation with what, um, you know, Zadie Smith calls a perverse and asymmetric understanding of human resource and value. So neoliberal market-based ideology depends on an account economy of extraction, on an economy, um, an extraction of labor and an extraction of resources. So we could ask ourselves why, for example, do people turn to extra legal channels for income in the underground economy? especially in the context of ghettos. Even further, why do people refuse work? Well, we can start with the fact that minimum wage isn't a living wage. And we insist on criminalizing the poor rather than recognizing that exploitative labor practices along with historic, global, and systemic racism preclude people from anything but poverty or, or low wealth. Now, this is economic injustice. Slide, please. <clears throat> so what would a restorative uh, or a corrective response to housing be as an alternative to resegregation, which we're seeing to further abandonment and withdrawal or increased controls um, you know, via surveillance? Um, we can begin from the core principle that 
what Naomi Klein calls sacrifice zones and sacrificial people are unethical and that a hierarchy of human value is a delusion. So imagining a more equitable future, uh, one in which people could thrive and express their full humanity and live with dignity in the context of affordable housing requires that we imagine um, different economic futures. We can see the overwhelming need for affordable housing and recognize homelessness as an affordability issue so that we preserve and expand public housing. And although um, new low cost housing, which Paul will show us, looks nothing like the outdated stereotypes of the high rise project, we need to be mindful and vigilant of how spaces are surveyed and managed. Um, there are radically uh, regressive proposals meant to obliterate the subsidized housing sector, like work re requirements, rent increases, increased surveillance, aimed at identifying um, undocumented residents and their families. So we have to be mindful of you know, the normalization of of classist language like persistent or dependent and how potent um, the combination of policy, language and aesthetics are in doing the work of perpetuating poor people's exclusion. Yes, the, the governance model actually propelling us forward at this moment isn't one focused on justice or on belonging, but on automating inequality by digitizing poor people's identities. Um, and the way we think of public housing has changed over time. So in the 1930s and 40s, housing is seen as a fundamental human right. And by the 90s, the same concept is labeled socialist or radical, accompanied by increasing conservative policies. But how we think of public housing can shift again. Slide, please. So we've been talking about the ways in which poverty and housing are arenas of power. Now we can consider what an anti-hierarchical or anti-authoritarian approach would look like. A future with dignity and justice as its guiding principles. And it would be from you know, public housing to supportive housing, housing that recognizes um, the unjust burdens and disadvantages of um, the economically vulnerable. A new model for supportive housing is Sugar Hill in Harlem. It was built in 2015. It's, uh, there are 124 subsidized apartments. Um, there's a children's museum, an early childhood center, a farmer's market on its grounds, and it's beautifully designed. Um, and when asked about his work on the project, superstar architect um, Sir David Ajay responded, my primary consideration has been dignity. Um, so public housing could be a site of new possibilities and a new understanding of community. You know, rejecting the demand for sacrificial populations, even actively displacing uh, this paradigm, refusing it in some way altogether. Um, and we can imagine um, public housing communities as symbols of um, the creative mutuality between vul once vulnerable, now protected communities and the state showing us what could be created when, um, when we place justice and dignity and care and basic goodness at the center. <clears throat> I can imagine such a place, I could imagine um, a project with you know, a community center and communal spaces, uh, with maybe with low cost storefront spaces for homegrown um, businesses and spaces within the projects for commerce and exchange food pantries on the premises so that no child or family ever go without. Um, I Im imagine spaces that communicate abundance, um, both physical and aesthetic. So there could be a future in which public housing projects can be symbols of hope and care and revolutionary praxis, signaling, signaling that we, we care for and support the vulnerable as extensions of ourselves and this is to understand interconnectedness and that each of our well-being is predicated both on the labor and the well-being of others. Um, now I'll pass the mic to Paul Walker-Clark.
Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, let's have the next slide. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce this as my own snapshot of housing, both historic and possible. Uh, this first one is the Langston Terrace Homes in Washington, D.C., uh, done in uh, 1935. And it was extraordinary at this time that the architect chosen was Hilliard Robinson, uh, at a time where most white architectural firms were clamoring for federal contracts. This one was given to Hilliard Robinson, an African-American who taught architecture at Howard University and actually lived in the vicinity of this site. And he understood the, uh, the community that this was being built in. And he created a courtyard housing scheme. I should also say that Hilliard Robinson toured Europe and studied housing throughout Europe in the early 20th century. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Um, this was done at the time of Art Deco. Uh, a local artist was hired to adorn the structure. It was built around the courtyard, which Hilliard Robinson saw as the hearth of the community, where children could play and be seen. Um, in the 1970s, 1980s actually, a, a movie was made of this by Barr Weissman called Home, in which adults who grew up as children, uh, the terrace homes, were uh, saluting its, its sense of community and home and the fact that as children, every adult in that project was a parent to them. And they were corrected and, and, uh, and loved by everyone. Uh, and they speak very highly of it. Unfortunately, the movie Home by Barb Weissman is out of circulation. Uh, right now, I think it's only available through the Library of Congress. But if you could get a, an opportunity to see it, I certainly recommend it. Next slide, please. Certainly, if you want to see the state of housing design today, I would recommend Michael Piatuk and Associates. Uh, Michael Piatuk uh, was the son of a Finnish immigrant in the 1940s. He grew up in a three, third floor cold water flat in Brooklyn. Uh, and indeed, it uh, was very much of a community that had a safety net, social infrastructure, his office is in Oakland, California. Um, in his practice, he will not take on a commission of housing unless he has a community group or a community representative that he can work with, that he can help guide the program uh, with that group through all the review processes. And he's very familiar with you know, city council meetings, design review boards, neighborhood advisory boards, uh, and you make sure the housing is bedecked in the architectural uh, elements of the surrounding context so that it cannot be attacked on aesthetic grounds uh, without attacking the very neighborhood it's being inserted into, which is usually a middle-class neighborhood. Uh, next slide, please. So his housing has bay windows, courtyards, uh, picket fences, the iconographic aspects of what we would term dwelling or houses. Uh, next slide, please. And again, you can say there's an aesthetic to his work, but he really does try to reflect the context that it's inserted in so that the project is a good neighbor in a neighborhood. Next. Next. Next, please. And we'll continue, please. And this is the work of Harvest Ted Smith, Ted Smith and Kathy McCormick, known as the Red Office in San Diego. Um, Ted Smith went deep into the weeds of the local zoning laws, and he discovered that the single family house is defined by the number of kitchens. So one kitchen is allowed in a single family house. Uh, 
having discovered this, he went and was able to gain title to some properties in erstwhile middle-class neighborhoods that had not been developed because of terrain. And he built a single family house with one communal kitchen and several apartments. Uh, he was able to build four or five of these, and this is not a picture of those, but uh, before the city council of San Diego closed that loophole. But he is one sort of uh, anarchist as far as getting things built. Uh, this is a project of his that has loft, two-story apartments, uh, studio apartments, one-bedroom apartments. Uh, and he does a mix and he tries to find opportunities within the housing market to address housing needs of those who are not typically addressed by the housing market. Go to the next, please. Other cities uh, have come to realize that their service personnel, police, fire personnel, teachers can't afford to live in their cities. And so Baltimore has taken the exception to address abandoned industrial buildings and rehab them into housing, in this case, for their teachers in their school system. Next. This is another example of that in Baltimore. Uh, an old tin factory, tin can factory. Next, please. And just to change how we think about housing, this is an example from Amsterdam, and it is housing over an elementary school. Uh, the next, please. Here you can see that the first two stories is the elementary school. It is a courtyard configuration in which the courtyard is the playground for the elementary school. And the courtyard is closed from the adjacent street by the gymnasium for the school. Next, please. And there is the gymnasium and the courtyards above. And I've been able to visit this. Uh, and I actually went back a couple of times to see when uh, recess was in session. And the parents would come out in the balconies to look at their children below playing. Um, the curious question to me is, is what happens when the child outgrows elementary school? Do the families move elsewhere or do they remain? Um, I'm not sure, don't know. But it certainly is a dynamic mix use of, of housing. Next, please. And if you want to study a range of housing, uh, the Netherlands is an excellent example. They have subsidized housing that reach well into the middle class. And this is an example from the 1920s uh, by Mikael Brinkman, uh, in which an elementary school is in the center building of this project. Uh, and I'm sure it's one of the projects that Hilliard Robinson studied when he toured Europe. Uh, next, please. And these are flats and two-story units. Uh, they're all cold water uh, units. The, a uh, hot water heater would be an extravagant expense in the 1920s. And so bathing is in a central facility above the grade school in the center building there. Uh, next, please. Another example of a city whose service personnel cannot afford to live in is Paris. And the French government has created several projects of which housing is made for postal workers this is one where housing is above and behind a postal office. Next, please. And this is the interior court of that on the right. And next, please. And my own um, enthusiasm is for this. Within a capitalist economy where uh, this is sort of an architectural form of social security. Next, please. where a family can rent out, well, this is a, actually a two-story unit over a one-story unit. And a family can rent out the flat at grade to subsidize their mortgage. And indeed, banks will loan money to a greater extent if you have a revenue-producing entity on your lot. So uh, it certainly is uh, within a mercantile or capitalist economy, this seems to be a reasonable aspect. So you can rent out the flat to subsidize their mortgage. Next, please. 
As the family grows, the flat can be incorporated into the domicile. And then eventually as children become adults and live elsewhere, the parents can retire to the flat and rent out the townhouse. And I've seen examples of this in Ireland that are being developed uh, when I was traveling there in the 1990s. Uh, next, please. And these are examples around the United States uh, of new housing. Uh, this is a development near a transit line, uh, has commercial on the ground floor, and it says 50 dwelling units. Next, please. This is affordable housing for formerly homeless individuals. Uh, this is a lead uh, building. Uh, that is, it's an energy conserver conserving uh, design. Next. And again, we go back to Michael Piatuk. This is a more recent uh, project of his in Oakland. And next, please. This is the courtyard of that particular project. And I believe this may be the end of my part. Next, nope, one more. Uh, this is in the Bronx. And I think there is a, another one after this, excuse me. So very quickly, that's housing today. Janice, back to you. Right. So um, <clears throat> now we'd like to open up the floor for conversation uh, and questions. And if you'd like to type your, um, your questions into the chat, that would be great. And while people are formulating their questions and typing, um, I'd like to invite any questions from the panelists that you might have for each other or from Margaret Kohler, if you have questions for the panelists. I would have one for the panelists, um, which is, can you hear me? Okay, which is, um, you know, you've been thinking about this at the level of housing units, but what would something else need to happen with the larger organization of metropolitan areas in terms of, you know, urban, suburban, exurban, like what would need to change or be restored in that larger sense? Well, just speaking as a sociologist, we have to re rethink our economic structure and our tax base for sure. And our economic models aren't working. There is no living wage for people who are uh, below the poverty line. And our um, vast inequality in the United States is growing and it's not getting better. Plus, we have to change the culture around housing the way Magda was speaking about it as well. I mean, the current administration talked about harming the suburbs by having multi-unit families. So we have a lot of work to do. So from the economics, the politics, and the cultural, social aspects, things have to change. I would also add, if we were to have another uh, regime of subsidized housing with the Section 8, um, there's nothing to prevent the market from just swallowing that and inflating rents again. And I'll be the socialist of the group. I think we need to go th and think about rent control and that uh, you can't address housing inequality without certain amounts of control and rent being low. Um, there are consequences to that, that uh, given this ec economy, if you control rent, then you may have consequences of less repair or uh, more debilitation of housing stock. So uh, it's complicated and I will admit that, but I think we do need some notion of controls. So we have a question from one of the, um, one of the attendees, Chuck Pauly. Should we consider the Singaporean model of government housing? And so if we don't, um, 
if the panelists are not aware of that, we can ask Chuck to clarify that or, but if you know about it, you can speak to that. Chuck, maybe can you, um, can you say a little bit more about what about the Singapore model of government housing? And while you type that in, um, can I pitch in something as far as the, the conversation about um, what, what Paul was speaking to? Going back again to the 19th century, the housing reformers also urged a limit on return to investors that not even just controlling rents, right, which they did, but also saying, you know, we shouldn't be making huge profits off of housing. So even just thinking about it differently from the perspective of uh, the real estate management, not in relation to, you know, publicly funded housing, but overall, that this shouldn't be an area where we should be looking for, you know, people to be making, you know, excessive amounts of money off of, off of housing. So I think, you know, yeah, just sort of thinking differently um, is something we, we haven't done. <laughs> And um, I think to that, Amy, uh, Chuck clarified that the government controls about 80% of the housing in Singapore. Um, in other words, it's, you know, it's not a, um, it's not a for-profit, it doesn't seem. So maybe um, the panelists could addre address what might be the implications of that. Oh, uh, that, and then also let me just put out another question from Julie. What are your thoughts on housing as a business rooted in capitalism? So this is right along the same lines. Do you believe the economic profits are necessary as a human necessity? Shouldn't it be a right? Uh, would that need legal? So this is right along the lines of healthcare, right? Uh, would that need legal or constitutional change to become a reality? How much profit is made from housing? So just kind of the whole question of capitalism, profit, and um, is it a human right? I would certainly endorse it being a human right. Uh, the housing is a significant part of our land market. And investment in land is an inextricable, uh, it's an integral part of our economy. You know, it's sort of the second circuit of capital investment that uh, when certain aspects of the marketplace is saturated, investment in land is an alternative. And when that gets saturated, investment elsewhere. But there's no doubt that land and development is an integral part of this economy. And therefore, when you talk about you know, the government taking 80% of the housing market under its wings, it has significant ramifications throughout. Uh, Having said that, I am for housing being a right and um, any means to achieve that. Magda, can you tell us about your project that you're working on now in Athens? I know it's been put on hold, but can you describe how it was a grassroots movement to claim space, place, and neighborhood? I'd be happy to. Um, it's, it's such an inspiring, um, you know, sort of current story. Um, there is a neighborhood in Athens um, named Exarchia. It's been a historically uh, leftist um, enclave. And in response to the influx of refugees, um, mostly Syrian refugees, in um, 2008, um, the citizens of Exarchia mobilized uh, to occupy abandoned uh, buildings, apartment buildings, an abandoned hotel, abandoned storefronts. Um, so they occupied these spaces to organize um, like reception halls, housing, and services for both the influx of refugees and for Greeks um, that had been affected by um, by the turn in, 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 in Greece's economy in 2008. So what we've seen in Exadhia, like as a lesson, is that 
you're anti-authoritarian, anti-hierarchical spaces could exist in cooperation. So it's the entire neighborhood that sort of is in consensus that you know goods and services are on an exchange basis. So they're based on um, people um, uh, providing healthcare for free and in exchange having other things given to them. So there are, you know, sort of soup kitchens that are that's beyond the soup kitchen. It's beyond this this gesture of charity. It's it's this gesture of mutuality is that we're we are cooking together, we are providing for the neighborhood. We they provide, you know, diapers and formula and um, child care. And they've lit quite literally, I mean it's it's beyond occupying the neighborhood. This is what the neighborhood is. This is how the neighborhood is organized. And it's, um, it's incredibly contentious within the larger uh, context of, of Athens. Um, it is a, a communist, anarchist, an anti-authoritarian stronghold within the city. And whereas, you know, our, our impetus is like sort of to criminalize that, to be afraid of, of those words and you know those identities um they're filling the void of social services that the grecian government simply can't um you know can't provide sort of economically financially um so it's, it's a really interesting interesting case study thank you for asking so we have a question from olivia i'm not sure if this question relates but the words, the American dream, but uh, the following words, the American dream, does the U.S. even serve, deserve to claim that statement anymore? Meaning, can the U.S. still claim that coming here can fulfill a person's American dream? I ask because considering the amount of inequity and poverty in the U.S., as well as the fact that you start out poor, then it's almost set in stone that you won't catch up. It just seems like the American dream is a fal is falsified hope for people. Um, and just very quickly, yes, we can make the slides available and this talk is being recorded. And so we will make that available also on the, uh, on the exhibition website. I just wanted to add uh, in response to the American dream question, economist Raj Chetty out of Princeton University published a paper last year, which in effect said, yes, the American dream is dead. What we consider social mobility, being able to go from poverty to the middle class and the middle class to the upper middle class is near impossible in the United States, especially when compared to other wealthy countries around the world. We're going to need both grassroots, bottom up uh, demands for change, and we're going to have to take a hard look at unfettered capitalism because it's just not working. And then another question, uh, Julie, do you think this last presidential cabinet will help uh, in more liberal radical thinking in terms of housing because it is so conservative? Or did this nation's office did this nation's office only reaffirm more conservative ideals? So I think the question is around conservatism and, and how to work with um, all of these labels and what they might actually mean. And Julie, in response, I, I, I don't think I know the, the answer to, to your question, but what's been um, helpful in framing um, sort of my political consciousness over time has been to recognize that, you know, the policies in place um, at this moment are that have historically um, excluded people or that have um, you know, hollowed out the welfare function of the state. Those are policies that have been enacted under, you know, both um, Democratic and Republican governments. So um, there isn't, um, there isn't an, an, an easy fix. Um, I think that to really um, enact change is to, is to move further, is to go even further, is, is maybe to, you know, to adopt some radically progressive policies that um, sort of departing from what we've tried in the past that has brought us to this moment. Um, 
That's my two cents. Magda, I'm struck by the example that you gave in Athens and how it demands nothing of the state. And I think that's it, that when you say going beyond, um, going beyond in that case means taking hands off and saying, you've got this. Is that naive of me to say that? I mean, we're seeing it, we're seeing it being done, right? We, we've seen it in, in Portland, um, aspects of it. Um, it's, it's, this, it's, it's a progressive um, coming closer to ideas that, that we find threatening, ideas that we haven't tried before, ideas that are risky, but, but saying have, there being a willingness sort of to, to depend on one another or to trust one another or to not criminalize one another. These, these are all, uh, they seem like small shifts, but it's all these small shifts that I think create a, a different kind of world. Well, and we have a long history in the United States of divide and conquer. People in power pit uh, those of us who are less fortunate against each other. Oh, the Mexicans are taking our jobs. The radicals are, are uh, taking over the city. So they can pit afraid poor white people against, say, afraid poor black people. And it's an old strategy that keeps people in power and keeps policies stagnant, too. And Amy, I, I was thinking of, of, of you today. Um, I, I was thinking about the ways in which sort of historical, you know, tenement houses, you know, were, were you know, were aimed at the poor in general and how as people, you know, move into whiteness, right, as, as immigrants that once needed those services move into whiteness, um, you know, those, those spaces become spaces for others. And it's the same thing that happened, um, you know, to Marine Terrace. And it's, you know, sort of understanding how we other people and th this progressive othering and that today it looks like one thing and, you know, 100 years ago it looked like another. And it's, there, there are these cycles. Yeah, well, and I think the, the opposite has happened too. And you look at, at Boston, some of the, the housing that was built as model tenement housing for predominantly immigrant neighborhoods in the North End are today <laughs> North End apartments that are, yeah, expensive and unaffordable. So, you know, so it does, it goes, it goes both, both ways um, for sure as far as the whole issue of, of where you are. I mean, I think even thinking back to that question about I think that Margaret asked about suburbs and, and cities and you know the, the way urban sprawl happens and issues of transportation that that don't you know that haven't been talked about yet I mean if you're rural poor the the challenges of you, know, you might be able to find housing but you're so dependent on a car that works and no grocery stores nearby and you know so the, the 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 challenges of just how we do organize our our spaces and our neighborhoods and what becomes desirable and who then gets forced out and what then becomes undesirable is yeah an ongoing saga that we don't we don't confront what to do what do we do with all these empty plazas around columbus right all these desolate shopping malls, you know, these, what do we do with that? Can I ask one more? Um, I don't know if all of you know about it, but I just wondered if any of you had any thoughts. I know there has been talk of Otterbein partnering with the city of Westerville to create this like West campus. Um, and I think the words affordable housing were used in one of the emails from the president of Otterbein, which was interesting to me, but it, you know, a kind of mixed use. I don't know if any of you know anything about it or have thoughts about what that ought to look like if, if it goes forward. 
I've only read what's in the paper and what the president has sent us. I think um, he says he's going to, the university is going to work with the developers. And I think the architects and developers are key to making this a responsible response uh, in the built environment. And somebody should get on that committee, Margaret. Yeah. Yeah, because I think I, he said at the town hall that what the developer said, well, we don't need to worry about affordable housing because everyone can use vouchers, right? And that will work well enough. So, I mean, that was thrown, I believe, thrown out at the town hall, which I think was recorded. So we could go back and check. But um, yeah. I think the transportation hub is kind of what they're hanging their hat on for being innovative, perhaps. I don't know. Well, um, I really hate to be the one to end this because I feel like we've just started scratching the surface and really having a conversation. Um, but I want to thank all of you for being here. Magda, thank you for all of your work that really um, ignited and catalyzed this conversation. Um, Amy and Carla for jumping in and seeing the opportunity to bring everyone together. Paul for joining us and Margaret for really stepping in and making the webinar aspect of this happen. Um, really appreciate working with you guys. So this recording will be available on the Ghosts and Sunlight website, um, and we'll try and also make it available elsewhere. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thanks for attending. Thanks for including me. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Good idea, Amy and Magda. Good idea, Amy. <laughs>